Ik doe ook wel even. Welcome to this press conference at the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Uh, welcome to the press conference at the Wetenschapsakademy. We hope that we will be in time. Maybe one minute later or so. Uh, I think we will be on time maybe one or two minutes late. Thank you.
Välkomna till Kungliga vetenskapsakademin och den här presskonferensen när vi ska presentera årets Nobelpris i fysik. Welcome to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and this press conference when we will announce this year's Nobel Prize in Physics. We will keep to our tradition uh, and begin the presentation in Swedish and then continue in English. Uh, you are, of course, later on uh, welcome to ask questions in either of these languages. Jag heter Hans Ellegren. Jag är ständig sekreterare här på Kungliga vetenskapsakademin. Till höger om mig här sitter professor Eva Olsson som är ledamot av Nobelkommittén i fysik. Och till vänster professor Tors Hans Hansson, också ledamot av Nobelkommittén i fysik och sakkunnig inom ämnet. My name is Hans Ellegren. I'm the Secretary General of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. And to my right is Professor Eva Olsson, member of the Nobel Committee in Physics. And to my left, Professor Tors Hans Hansson, also member of the Nobel Committee in Physics and expert in this field. Årets pris handlar om kvantmekanikens kraft. This year's prize is about the power of quantum mechanics. Kungliga vetenskapsakademin har idag på morgonen beslutat att utdela 2022 års Nobelpris i fysik i lika delar till Alain Aspect, Université Paris-Saclay och École Polytechnique Palaiso, Frankrike. Eljon F. Clauser, J. F. Clauser and Associates, Walnut Creek, California, USA, och till Anton Seilinger, Universitet Wien, Österrike. Det tilldelas priset för experiment med sammanflätande fotoner som påvisat brott mot Bell-olikheter och banat väg för kvantinformationsvetenskap. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has this morning decided to award the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics in equal share to Alain Aspin, Université Paris-Saclay, and Ecole Polytechnique Palaiso, France. John F. Clauser, J. F. Clauser and Associates, Walnut Creek, California, USA, and to Anton Seilinger, University of Vienna, Austria. They received the prize for experiments with entangled photons, establishing the violation of Bell inequalities and pioneering quantum information science. Professor Olsson will now give us a short summary. Please. Thank you. So quantum information science is a vibrant and rapidly developing field. It has broad and potential implications in areas such as secure information transfer, quantum computing, and sensing technology. Its origin can be traced to that on quantum, quantum mechanics. Its predictions have opened doors to another world, and it has also shaken the very foundations of how we interpret measurements. What today is considered logical, measurable, and quantifiable was initially debated by Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein in philosophical terms. John Bell transformed the philosophical debate into science and provided testable predictions that launched experimental work. This year's Nobel Prize in Physics honors the groundbreaking work and science of the central figures Alain Aspect, John Clauser, and Anton Seilinger, who took up the challenges of Bell and tackled them in the laboratories. Professor Tosh Hans Hansson will present the details of the work. Thank you. Thank you. A more detailed presentation. Thank you, Emma. 
introduction. Um, Einstein, in a letter to colleague, famously wrote, I'm convinced that he, and he meant God, does not play dice. And what did he mean with this? Quantum mechanics, the theory of atoms and light, had been immensely successful, but it was also very weird. For instance, take the simplest atom, hydrogen, just one electron moving around the proton. Quantum mechanics couldn't even tell you where the electron was, just the probability to find it somewhere. Einstein didn't like that. He thought that a good theory should give you precise predictions, just as Newton's theory tells you exactly where the moon is in its Earth, in its orbit around the Earth at every moment. Not everybody agreed. Here are two of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics, Niels Bohr and Edwin Schrödinger. They thought that quantum mechanics was okay as it was, didn't need anything more, we just had to accept the peculiarities. Uh, and this position was put very clearly in this paper written in 1935 by Edwin Schrödinger. Uh, it was an answer to a paper written earlier that year by Einstein, Boris Podolsky, and Nathan Rosen. And they had come up with the thought experiments, which they thought proved, demonstrated, that quantum mechanics couldn't be the full story. And now I will explain to you a modern version of that experiment. So, here you see a source. This source emits pairs of particles, entangled pairs, bell pairs. We'll come back to that concept. And they reach Alice and Bob, who makes measurement. They measure the property of these particles that is called spin. And in quantum mechanics, this spin can only take two values, plus or minus. So what happens when you do it many times? Alice will see a sequence of pluses and minus, plus, minus, plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, etc. It looks completely random. And the same is true for Bob. But the strange thing is that when they compare the measurements, every time Alice is a plus, Bob will see a minus, and vice versa, and that's very strange, because they are far away from each other, and these particles look exactly the same. Uh, so, well, perhaps, let's look at it. Here, we have the quantum cards. They look all the same, huh? We shuffle them, or entangle them, and then here they go. And they can answer questions on signs. What sign do you have? Plus? What sign do you have? Minus. Okay, let's take another set of quantum cards. Here they go. What sign? Plus. What sign? Minus. Hmm, strange. They look the same. How could they know what sign they have? Well, you see, here it is a trick. That is the following thing. Look, that was a minus. And... That was a plus. So each entangled pair had one plus and one minus. I shuffled them so you didn't know where the minus went there or there, but it was always one plus and one minus. So could it be that quantum mechanics was the same? Could it be that there were hidden informations like on the cards? Could it be that nature was a trickster? Okay, just like I was before. Perhaps quantum mechanics is not complete. Perhaps there is something here. Einstein would have liked that. Uh, and it's a very natural way to think that it would be like that. But years went on, decades went on. No one found such a theory that could explain the experiments with such hidden variables. So this became something more of a philosophical question. Most physicists didn't care very much uh, until in 1964, John Bell 
made an amazing theoretical discovery. By looking at a variation of this experiment that I just told you about, he could show that in that case, the predictions of quantum mechanics couldn't be reproduced by any kind of theory based on hidden variables, however complicated. And when you think of it, that's really strange, because that means that when you measure on one of these particles, it's not so that you just reveal a property that is already there and measure. No, the quantum information about the state is in the full entangled state of both particles. Indeed, very strange. And so thought the young John Clauser, who said, ah, let's do, let's do uh, Bell's experiment. Let's perform it in the lab. Perhaps quantum mechanics isn't right in that situation. Now, that was easy to say, not so easy to do, because with the existing lab equipment, you couldn't, make, you couldn't perform that experiment. But with collaborators, he came up with a variation of the experiment that could be performed, and he and the late Stuart Friedman went to the lab, they did, they did it, and they found that quantum mechanics works also in this case. Now, there were loopholes. Uh, and one particular loophole that John Bell had been very concerned about was that of locality. That means that Alice shouldn't be able to send signals to Bob so they could sort of agree on the result of the measurements. And that was hard to exclude experimentally. But in 1976, Alain Espé wrote a paper where he proposed such an experiment. And a couple of years later, went to the lab, performed the experiments, and guess, again, quantum mechanics rules. So why is this a big deal? They didn't know that quantum mechanics works. Well, to explain to you why it's such a big deal, Let's go back again to 1935. Here is another paper by Schrödinger, which he says, I would not call entanglement one, but rather the trait of quantum mechanics. So now, much later, in retrospect, we understand that in addition to the profound philosophical and foundational implications of the Bell, of the studies of Bell states. The experiments performed by Clauser and Aspe opened the eyes of the physics community to the depth of Schrodinger's statement and provided tools for creating and manipulating and measuring states of particles that were entangled, although they were far away. And physicists now started to understand that entanglement and bell pairs is a quantum resource that you can use to achieve amazing new things. And it's no time here to even start to tell you the, that story. I will just give you one example, which is picked, because it illustrates one of the many groundbreaking contributions by the third of this year's uh, laureates, Anton Seidinger. So to understand this, you have to know that the goal of a quantum mechanics today is to build a quantum network. What is that? A quantum network is a series of nodes, and these nodes should be able to communicate via quantum entanglement. In these nodes, you can have quantum devices like encryption devices. How do you build such a network? It's difficult because entanglement is brittle. If you send it to an optical fiber, it very easily gets destroyed. So you need some new trick. And just an amplifier won't work because amplifiers destroy entanglement. Uh, so here is the trick the method that Anton Seilinger came up with. It's called entanglement swapping. You have two of these bell pairs, like this. One of the particles here, one, 
and the other fourth goes far away from each other. The two other comes together. Here, you make a measurement so you entangle particle two and three. And then magically, one and four becomes entangled, although they had never been close to each other. It's wonderful. So now you can think of doing it in a chain. You do one, you could do another, you do a third, etc., and you can build up a network. Another method to get long range entanglement is not to use optical fibers, but to send just light through the air. And I'll just give you one spectacular example of that, this. And that was in 2018. Uh, there was an intercontinental quantum link set up using the Chinese Mikius quantum satellites between the group of Yan Wei Fan, the Academy of Science in China, and the Tantal Science Group in Austria. Over over 7,600 kilometers, pretty amazing. And now we are at the forefront of current research, and I will just end with a few comments. So today we honor three physicists whose pioneering experiments showed us that the strange world of entanglement and bell pairs is not just the micro world of atoms, and certainly not the virtual world of science fiction or mysticism, but it's the real world that we all live in. And researchers now, all over the world, they use entanglement and bell pairs, both in curiosity-driven fundamental research and in utility-driven applications, such as quantum cryptography or quantum computing. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Pro Professor Hansson. Now we shall see if we may have one of the laureates <coughs> with us. Uh, Professor Anton Seilinger, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, good, good morning, Professor Seilinger. Uh, uh, please ac accept our warmest congratulations to receiving the Nobel Prize in Physics. Thank you very much. It was very kind to receive your phone call just about an hour ago. And I'm still uh, kind of shocked, but it's a very positive shock. Thank you very much. So were you surprised to, to get the call? Yes, I was actually very surprised to get the call. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm sitting here in the session hall of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and uh, we are at the press conference live here. Uh, there are many interested journalists uh, from uh, the international press as well as from Sweden. Uh, would you be ready to take some questions from them? With pleasure, yes. But I, I don't understand Swedish, but... <laughs> I'm sure they will ask in, in English at least. Uh, questions? Right. Esvetia? Hello, Professor Zeilinger. Glückwünsche, herzlichen Glückwünsche. Congratulations. This is uh, Swedish television. Um, I'm curious, could you say something? We can read in the paper here that you demonstrated quantum teleportation, which does sound like something absolutely impossible. Could you say something how it is possible? Yes. Actually, uh, quantum teleportation uh, uh, uses uh, the, the uh, features of entanglement. It is not like in the, in the Star Trek films or whatever, transporting something, uh, I mean, uh, certainly not a person, uh, over some distance, but the, the, the point is using entanglement. You can transfer all the information which is carried by an object over to some other place where the object is is, uh, so to speak, reconstituted. And this is done, and that is actually the surprising feature. Uh, you can transfer the information without knowing the information. Because to know the information would violate Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So, so far, this has only done with very small particles. Uh, and it is certainly <laughs> absolutely impossible to, to think of, of, of very large objects. 
but it's fun fundamentally important for for transferring information uh, maybe between quantum computers. Okay, we have several hands raised there. Was the one here, please? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I'm home. This is Nordic Chinese Hans. Uh, first, congratulations on getting this year's Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, can you kindly share with us what inspired you of the idea of this topic and uh, to what extent will the work uh, influence the future of the quantum physics or even science in general? Thank you very much for that, for that question. I have to say that I was, I was always interested in quantum mechanics from the very first moments when I read about it. And I was actually uh, uh, struck by some of the, of the theoretical predictions, but they, because they, they did not fit uh, you know, the usual intuition which, which one might have. So I was lucky to, to, to work in Vienna with my supervisor, Helmut Rau, who was a pioneer in quantum physics. And he provided the freedom to do this, these experiments, which at that time were completely philosophically without any, any possible uh, uh, use or application. And uh, uh, you know, this has changed now, as it has been mentioned. There are possible applications discussed and also implemented in laboratories. Uh, the interesting point is that some of the fundamental questions, the very question, what does this really mean in a, in a, in a basic way, are still unanswered in my life. And that is, uh, is an Avenue for new research. Thanks so much, uh, so much for sharing. Yeah, one question there at the back. Uh, David Keaton from the Associated <coughs> Press. Congratulations, Professor. Uh, first of all, I'd like to ask what, in your opinion, signifies this prize for the field in general of quantum mechanics? What does it mean for this field of research, uh, do you believe? And second of all, in 2022 today, what excites you the most in this field? What areas do you think uh, are the, the going to be the, the areas that are going to be yielding the most uh, new discoveries, both uh, theoretical but also maybe practical? Thank you. Well, I, I, I guess that, uh, I mean, this, is, this prize is an encouragement to young people, and I would mention here that the prize would not be, not be possible without, you know, more than 100 young people who worked with me over the years and made all this possible because I alone could not have achieved uh, this, that is quite clear. So I look at it as an encouragement, uh, particularly for young people. My advice would be do what you find interesting and, and, and don't care too much about possible applications. On the other hand, I, I, I understand uh, this recognition is very important for the future development of possible applications, and this is going to be uh, quite interesting. I will, I'm curious what we will see in the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, uh, that is, in my eyes, uh, this is absolutely quite open. On the foundations, the, uh, the fundamental thing, the, the issues about, about reality uh, and, the net, and the whole of space-time in a very fundamental way is still not answered, and I expect some some, some, some interesting experiments there in the coming years. Okay, we have more questions here, please. Congratulations, Professor Denninger. So this is Yujun speaking from uh, Geneva Observatory. So my question is, uh, what happens if we send an entangled particle into a black hole? Do we still get information from it? Thanks. Oh, this is, a, this is a, a very basic question about the, the nature of black holes and what happens there. I should say I'm not a specialist for that. I'm, I'm more, I, 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 I mean, you know, the last year there was a, a well, no, there were very other prices for, for black holes. Also, uh, yes, a black hole is in the center of the universe. And for, for, uh, probably Professor Kensel and Professor Penrose can better answer, answer your question. I, I, have a naive, I have a naive idea. And my naive idea is that I think information cannot be lost forever. But that is just my personal opinion. 
Yes, please. Anneli Miegner Arn, uh, Swedish TV4. Congratulations on the prize. Uh, I would like to fill in Thomas von Heine's question from uh, SVT. And when you were talking about teleportation, when I think of teleportation, I think teleportation of mass, like a person is jumping from here to there in different galaxies, but you said teleportation of information only. Is that correct? So there is no mass involved here? Well, actually, you know, the important, this is a very good question, actually. Uh, I like that. Uh, the point is actually that, that it does not matter which mass uh, uh, something is composed of. For example, if I exchange all the, all the carbon uh, atoms in my body with the carbon atoms in somebody else's body, I'm still the person. It doesn't matter. Uh, it, inf important is the information. Important is how is the object constituted? How are these, all these constituents uh, arranged together? And that is what defines individuality and so on. Not the matter of which we... So you mean that in the very, very future, like maybe 10,000 years from now, you might be able not to actually jump to another galaxy, but have uh, yourself uh, building up again from different, um, different material at another place, like the same that we are uh, sending TV now, for instance. That, that you get... Well, that's... well, at first, I'm, I might say that, that I'm not, I don't think that I will experience anything in 10,000 years. <laughs> that's a different question. Uh, the teleportation of, of, of uh, people is, today, it's the same kind of science fiction as it always was. So, so this is just science fiction, and it is not, a, in my eyes, it is not a question of science. Okay, uh, obviously a very exciting topic with an exciting last question here. Uh, I think this was the last question uh, from the press to you, Professor Seilinger. Uh, thank you, and uh, once again, uh, our warmest congratulations for um, the, receiving the Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, we look forward to meet you here in Stockholm in December at the Nobel Prize ceremony. See you then, Professor thank Seilinger. Thank you very much again. Yeah. Bye bye. Okay, let's move on uh, to more questions about the Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, about the research, uh, about the work of the committee, etc. Please, in either language, Swedish or English. No questions. One here, please. Yes. Yes. Uh, hello. My name is Linda Norsted. I'm from the technology newspaper New Technique. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about why you chose these three. Why, why is this knowledge worth the price? Professor Hanson? Well, uh, in my presentation, uh, I try to make clear what the three uh, laureates did. Um, and I should add, and I, I think I sort of alluded to that um, in my explanation, that of course Professor Scheilinger has also made a number of other groundbreaking contributions to the further development. But when looking at the complete field, that started, that was initiated by these groundbreaking experiments, the committee found that it would be wrong to just pick some of the very spectacular uh, elements that has appeared lately, like teleportation, you know. It's something that really makes, uh, makes headlines. But we wanted to go back and also honor the people who laid the ground for what was to become. So that, in short, was the motivation. 
By that we will close the press conference. Uh, thank you all for attending and we hope to see you again here tomorrow at the same time and we will present the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for 2022. So thank you. <laughs>